So our scripture this morning comes from John's Gospel, and this is chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. And see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today we wrap up this sermon series that we've been in, this series entitled Picture This, where we have taken paintings that have drawn their inspiration from the scriptures, and then we've used those paintings to guide us back into the scriptures. It's a way of not only hearing the scripture with our ears, but also hearing the scriptures with our eyes. And today's painting is by an artist named uh, Caravaggio. And uh, the name of the painting is The Incredulity of St. Thomas. And in a moment, we're going to have it up here on the wall, and uh, we'll unveil it here. And, of course, you can use your cell phones, and you can use the QR code on the front of the bulletin like we've done each week, and you can get that on your phone so you can, you know, zoom in and out and see. Or you can go to the website, www.icumc.org, and uh, click on Sermon Videos, and then you can uh, see the pictures there also. And so, uh, we will, like we've done every week, first thing we'll do is we'll just unveil the painting and we'll just spend a moment and uh, look at it and see what we notice. So, Elaine, if you would play us some picture viewing music there. I want to thank Elaine for playing our picture viewing music each week. She has done a terrific job with that. And the pieces that she has been playing, so it's a, it's a great big classical work called Pictures at an Exhibition, and it's a piece of music that has drawn its inspiration from a, an art exhibit. 
And uh, so it's a collection of uh, pieces that were written for each of the paintings that were in the, uh, the art exhibit. And then there's this musical promenade that moves you from painting to painting to painting. Well, what she has played each week is a different one of those promenades that moves us the paintings and we've uh, carefully picked the ones that match the right mood and and uh, you ought to see how many notes are on those pages um, very difficult work and thank you so much if you like that music um, the Kansas City Symphony is performing that as their season finale uh, on the weekend of July 21st we're gonna go see it if you want to go hear that piece you can uh, go hear the symphony play it um, so our painting today where in the world will we start with a painting like this and maybe the starting place is the familiarity of this. You know, I didn't even have to read the scripture. All I would have had to do was uncover the painting, and you immediately know what this is. It's Doubting Thomas. Even people who don't read our scriptures and share our faith know the story of Doubting Thomas, which is pretty astounding. And, but I would bet that probably not one in ten even the folks who read the scripture, could tell you what happened a week earlier from this night. You know, it's the paragraph, uh, you know, this is the first paragraph that we read. And it's a night where Jesus comes and the disciples are all safely locked in their room from the uh, Jewish folks. And Jesus comes and shows them his wounds. And when they see the wounds of Jesus... They, they celebrate my Lord, and they, they're, they're, they're happy to see the Lord. But it's not until after they see the wounds that they're glad to see him. And then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he gives them the power to forgive sins. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What more could happen in a night? And how significant is that, that the resurrected Jesus shows up to them, they receive the Holy Spirit, and are given the authority to uh, forgive sins. That's way more significant than one guy sticking his dirty finger in Jesus' side. You know, I just, just look at his thumbnail, how gross that is. You know, probably gave him an infection. It's just, you know, but so... And yet, we don't see the painting of the week before, even, that was a, so even though that was a far more significant night than this one. And yet, we all know this one. And I wonder why that is, that uh, we don't get the painting for the other night, but we do get it for this one. And I think the answer to that is this is a far more relatable story. But don't we all wrestle with doubts? And aren't we being asked to believe some pretty outrageous stuff? That there was this guy and he was fully human, but at the same time he was fully God, 100% human, 100% God, at the same time, 100 and 100, that doesn't add up to 100, but somehow the math is supposed to work. And then, uh, you know, he was killed, that's easy to believe, but then after three days was raised from the dead, interacted with people for a couple weeks, then ascends into heaven, and somehow from there is accessible to each of us. That's a pretty tough pill to swallow, don't you think? And don't we all wish we had the tangible proof, the finger in the side moment like Thomas gets to help us in our belief? You know, this... Painting. So there's no detail. You know, if you, look at, if you look at the room itself, we get no detail at all. Absolutely nothing. And we get no description of the room in the scriptures except for one. And that is that the doors were locked. So they were safely and fearfully locked inside this room for fear of the Jews. And so the disciples are in here safe from the doubters outside. And pretty extreme doubters they were too. The religious authorities did not believe in Jesus and they did not want anyone else to believe in Jesus. And so to not join them in their doubting, you might pay for that with your life. And so this room with its locked doors 
is supposed to safely separate the doubters out there from the non-doubters in here. And yet, what's happening inside this room? It's doubting, right? It's doubting. For this scene to be in John's gospel makes a lot of sense. And, th- and John's gospel is the only place where this you know, story about, well, unless I stick my finger in his side, I'll not believe, uh, shows up in John's gospel, and it makes sense for it to be there because John's gospel is a gospel that one of the main themes is this wrestling between belief and doubt and the reasons to believe. Now, John's gospel is the one that opens up with these weird words. That in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, you know, that business. And tucked in amidst all of that, you encounter this. That he came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. It's right in the very beginning. You encounter it, this reasoning, you know, why we ought to be believing, and it continues all through the first chapter. The second chapter opens up with the first of Jesus' miracles. Uh, John's gospel refers to them as signs, signs, reasons to believe. And the first miracle is turning the water into wine. And that episode ends with this, that Jesus kept this, the first of his, or that Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. You know, this was a reason to believe. And the rest of the chapter goes on with more of that. The third chapter, I'm not going to do them all, by the way, but the third chapter, uh, you know, is a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And you know from that conversation, we get one of our foundational verses for the entire uh, Bible, John 3.16. Whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Again, it's belief and reason to believe. And we could go page by page all the way to this. Another reason to believe. If we look at their heads, their heads make this really nice diamond shape right here. And Caravaggio has got them all really intently uh, focused together. Their heads are really close. And, you know, the intensity or the, the intentness with which they're looking, you know, they, they're, it's almost as though, you know, you would expect, you know, kids watching the baby bird be hatched or something, you know, would be this kind of intensity and, and focus. And, you know, for Thomas here, that makes sense. You know, he's the one, you know, having his finger in the side moment here. But for these two guys, what's the big deal? You know, this is old news to them. A week earlier, they had, they had had their, you know, uh, moment in the, their finger in the side moment. You know, Jesus had come and showed them his wounds and showed them his, his side. Why are they back, you know, with the same intensity as Thomas in, in this moment? Why would Carvaggio put them in there in that way? And I think it's a simple reason that... We always want more proof, don't we? That belief always has room for more buttressing. And to be certain can always uh, include more certainty. And that our faith is not uh, just one moment. That maybe we have one main reason for believing, but we add to that. You know, it's a, it, it's a main reason and then, uh, you know, supporting reasons to, to believe. Kind of a finger in the side reason surrounded by other things. You know, if somebody asks me what is my finger in the side reason to believe in a resurrected Jesus, I would tell you this. I believe in a resurrected Jesus because these guys believe in a resurrected Jesus. You know, these were the folks in the room, and they saw, and they so believed what they saw, and they so believed who they stuck their finger into, and and so believed uh, who this was that they were in the room with, that they took that belief outside the room and took it out into the world of extreme doubters. And almost every one of them paid for that belief with their life. And I know this. That nobody, or almost nobody, 
would willingly and knowingly go to their death over something that they knew to not be true. And so their belief, their, not, their, their, their having gone from uh, doubt to discovering belief and what they did with their finger in the side moment gives me my finger in the side reason for believing in Jesus. And that's why I proclaim Jesus in a world of extreme doubt. You know, we talked about these heads here and this moment. And, and you know, this, this moment here is so well captured that Caravaggio has really captured the doubt in this moment. And this, this paint, of all these paintings, you know, to really talk about a, a painting that is an instant, this is the one. And you can see on his face here just this, this transformation that happens in that instant where doubt discovers belief. And if you look at their, their faces here, so we've got four folks. Thomas is looking right here at his finger. And whoever this fellow is, he's looking right here at his finger. But the other two, Jesus is looking at Jesus' hand on his wrist. And this fellow is looking at Jesus' hand on his wrist. And I would ask you, which is more important to Thomas's faith? Is it actually sticking his finger in his side? Or is it this? Is it Jesus meeting him in his doubt and guiding him through that doubt? You probably have your finger in the side reason for believing in, in Jesus. But along with your finger in the side reason for believing Jesus, hasn't Jesus been guiding you in your doubts? You know, there's no detail in this room. This room could be any place. This room could be any time. And you could find yourself in this room anytime life leaves you doubting. The place where Jesus meets you in your doubt. This room is a safe place to doubt. But isn't that part of why we come here? That we come here with a mixture of, of faith and, and uncertainties. We come here with, well, I believe this, but I'm, I don't know about that. And isn't this the place where as we sing the songs and as we pray the prayers and as we hear the scriptures and as we receive the sacraments, isn't this a place where our faith is strengthened? And some of those questions become answered and, and we take that uh, strengthened faith and we take it out into the world and proclaim a risen Savior that we believe in. We might find ourselves in this place of doubt maybe a little more often than we want to. That something happens, the unthinkable happens, and we um, are living in disappointment. And our disappointment leaves us wondering. When life leaves us hurting and wounded and doubting, if we will be willing to enter the, vulnerable, the room of vulnerable doubt, will we not find Jesus' comforting touch there? Mm -hmm. Does not our healing come from Jesus' wounds? who suffered for each one of us? Was it not a room like this where Jesus took bread and said, this is my body which is given for you? And wasn't it a room like that where Jesus took a cup and said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for, for you? Yes, we've got our logical reasons for believing in Jesus, our finger-in-the-side reasons. But doesn't our greatest faith come when we experience Jesus leading through 
uh, our troubles, our uncertainties, our hurts, and our doubts, our disappointments. Isn't this bread that we receive? Isn't this juice that we share? Isn't this a way that we experience the comforting touch of Jesus who meets us in our doubts? Christ invites us to the table. He invites us to come with all of our doubts, all of our uncertainties, all of our hurts. And we're invited here to experience the comforting presence of Jesus, who is present to us in a, in a way like no other in this sacrament that we receive. It was on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us that he took bread and he gave thanks to God and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This that has been given to us, this bread, you know, it's tangible. You can touch it. It's as tangible as sticking a finger in, you know, Jesus' side. And this cup, same way. Tangible experiences of the presence of God, helping us and guiding us when we may doubt. And so, in remembrance of these, God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.